Hi, this is Stephen Brower. Uh, this is uh, sort of an introductory video for Chapter 5. I'm looking at two topics, which is deadlock and starvation. Um, a deadlock would occur when we have, uh, well, one example is when we have two processes. Um, and neither process can complete because it's waiting for something to be given up by the, or resource to be given up by the other process. Um, and so neither uh, process can uh, continue because they also can't grab maybe a, a resource that's being used by the other. Um, so two processes, each waiting for the other uh, to complete, neither can complete without the both resources, therefore becoming a deadlocked uh, situation. So the beginning of the chapter goes through a series of cases, uh, laying out uh, possible scenarios where uh, deadlock will occur. And then after those um, sort of seven cases are, are go through, then they identify the four conditions that are needed for a deadlock to occur. And those are those four conditions that are listed here um, on the screen. Um, and so all four of them would need to exist for a deadlock. Uh, now, just because something's listed here doesn't mean it's bad, and I'll explain with the first one and the idea of mutual exclusion. Um, and if we have something like a printer, we want to make sure if a process is sending stuff to a printer, so if it's in the middle of writing out characters to a page and it's halfway through a page, we don't want another process to come along and try to start sending stuff to that page, uh, up to, the, to the printer, so only one process at a time can have access to a printer. Um, and so that is, uh, it's a dedicated resources, uh, a, a dedicated resource, only one thing can access it at uh, a time. So it's not that it's bad. Um, in that case, we do want to uh, mutually exclude, in other words, to not let another process access the printer while a process is uh, using the printer. Again, all four of these conditions would have to be uh, uh, in place for a deadlock to possibly occur. The idea in resource holding is let's say there's a process and it's trying to run. Uh, let's say it has been running, it gets to a certain point, and now it's waiting for another process, but it's not releasing then another process that is currently using. Well, if it's on hold because it's waiting, uh, it can't go any further, but it's not releasing the process that, that it has. Well, by it not releasing a process that it has, there could be um, something else, another process, that is waiting for the resource that that process is holding, and that uh, process won't be able to grab that resource because that process is holding the resource that, that that's in place. Um, so by not um, releasing a, a resource, it can then prevent another uh, process from running. Um, preemption. Preemption would be, um, if, well, first of all, what preemption would be is if a process could be stopped, meaning also, um, well, a process could be stopped uh, so that another process then can run in its case, uh, and then when it's uh, doing that, um, to temporarily reallocate the resources that are being used. If we don't allow preemption, um, meaning that it's not allowed to give up the resources, then those resources are uh, held. And really, in a sense, at a high level, when you look at uh, two and three, um, they really seem kind of the same. In other words, a, a resource is not being released, um, and then by a, a process not being preempted um, and reallocating a resource, it's not being released. Um, circular weight would be if we have multiple processes. So suppose we have three processes, and process one is waiting for a resource that process two is using, process two is waiting for a resource that process three is using, process three is waiting for a resource that process one is using. Um, so in that situation there, it's you know a series of processes, each kind of waiting for, for uh, the other one to release a resource in order for it to proceed. The way that's going to be shown when we look in the book is through uh, a series of graphs. And the, the idea that we're going to, or we're going to be seeing uh, in terms of the graphs are a series of diagrams where we will see um, our processes and our resources in terms of, like maybe this process has this resource, this process has this resource, um, this resource uh, wants this resource, this process wants this, uh, wants this resource. And so the graph, which the idea consists of nodes and then links connecting them, we end up with what we call here um, a circle. Well, we see a cycle uh, that, that takes place because one thing is waiting for another, waiting for another, um, uh, etc. 
So um, again, the, what the book's going to do is lay out sort of like seven different scenarios and then take those seven scenarios and then say, okay, here are the four conditions that if any one of these conditions are, I'm sorry, if all four of these conditions are met, then a deadlock uh, can occur. So then we'll take a look at, well, how, how we can deal with it. Um, one thing is prevention. So by being aware of what causes deadlocks, then by preventing something to occur, then a deadlock uh, won't happen. So for example, um, the idea of maybe not giving a process resources until it actually can grab all the resources, meaning if a process needs two resources, um, then don't give it even one resource unless both um, are, are available. Uh, in the old days with mainframes, you had to say what resources a process used uh, at the very beginning of the job control language and only those resources it could access. And so when a job then is submitted, you can see the resources it needs and will only then uh, put it into the ready state, into the running state when the resources are available. Uh, the other thing in terms of prevention, the operating system can detect, are we going to get in a situation where we do have a circular wait? And then it'll try to prevent that uh, 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 from happening. Um, so by preventing one of those situations, then it can prevent a deadlock uh, from uh, uh, occurring. Um, well, detecting, now this, this might be the hard part, and that is um, have an operating system detect when a deadlock has occurred. And so um, you know, think of all the times you've used a computer and it's taken a long time for it to come back. So you're waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and it's just not coming back with, with the information. Um, what, in a sense, detection would be is the operating system be able to pick up on the fact that a process is languishing, that it's taking too long for it um, to complete, uh, and therefore um, it means that you know, maybe it's taking too long to complete because there is a deadlock and then the operating system needs to step in. So then recovery, um, one thing would be in terms of recovery that the operating system may have to target a process and kill the process. So in other words, stop a particular process from running. And that might be cataclysmic for that one process, but then by that one process being uh, canceled, it may free up then the resources so that the, uh, the system can uh, continue. Um, so anyway, so the, we'll, we'll look at in the chapter different ways of preventing, avoiding, detecting, and recovering from uh, deadlocks. The very last topic that is thrown in in terms of the chapter, um, and it's called uh, the dining philosopher's problem. And try not to get hung up on how disgust disgustingly gross the, <laughs> the, the, the problem is. The idea behind it is, you know, so imagine here that this is a philosopher and he's eating from this plate. And in order for him to eat, he has to pick up a fork both on his left and his right. And once both of those forks are, are picked up, then he can eat. Um, so imagine if this philosopher here is uh, waiting to eat and this philosopher here is currently eating. He can't eat because he's waiting for this fork on his right to be released uh, in order for him to continue. Well, if while he is waiting, uh, this philosopher two is waiting for this fork to be brought down. Suppose that philosopher three decides he wants to eat, so he picks up his, the fork on his left and his right. So now he has both of these forks. They're in use. And now let's say philosopher one puts down his forks. Well, now from philosopher two point of view, okay, fork one is available, but now he can't get to fork two because fork two is being used by philosopher three. And suppose this keeps going back and forth, where now philosopher one picks up the forks, then philosopher three puts them down, then philosopher three picks up the forks, and philosopher one puts them down, poor philosopher two um, starves. Um, so this is a, a problem, actually, uh, it's, a, it's a known problem in computer science, uh, but this, what it's trying to illustrate is how processes can languish in an operating system. And the idea is that the process never completes because it, it's unable to get the resources that it needs. Um, and so by understanding the idea of starvation, again, uh, then for an operating system, either preventing that from happening or detecting when a process then becomes languishing. Um, again, those are just a couple of, of key things from chapter five, the uh, deadlocks uh, and the starvation. Um, one of the things that we'll see in chapter six, which will be next week, um, are uh, the use of semaphores, which really is how multiple um, processors can handle dealing with uh, resources. And I'm trying to stop this. 
Here we go. <laughs>